I'm, I'm sure the participants must be eagerly waiting to interact with you. Therefore, I'd like to open this uh, discussion now to the Q&A. Uh, anyone who has a question can raise their hands, their, their digital hands, or maybe they can unmute themselves and ask. I can, uh, as usual, I, I can see uh, Rashid Motala has raised his hand, but Rashid, before you begin, I would like to tell you that it should be uh, related to the topic and no digressions. Absolutely. And Absolutely. just a question, please, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan Mikhail, for an excellent <coughs> treatise on Salim. I'm very impressed by what you said. But I just have a few things that I'd like to quickly, very short things. Number one, you state that the Ottoman did not try to convert or revert the Christians because they did not want to shake up the status quo. However, we must remember that the Ottomans were Muslims who were following the Quranic Ayah 2, 256. La ikra fi din min al meaning there is no compulsion in religion. The right direction is clearly distinguished from the wrong. Further, you state that concubinage is an Islamic concept. I wonder, I wonder whether, in fact, it was a Muslim as opposed to Islamic notion. And thirdly, and lastly, while it is a fact what you say that none out of the 36 sultans performed Hajj, however, Yahud Sultan Salim the first Ottoman Khalif did perform Umrah on his way to victory in Hijaz in 1517. And the presence of the Ottoman sovereign, just like the Mamluk rulers before them from the mid 13th to dawn of the 20th century, on the annual Hajj, they represented by the Mahmal, a palanquin of embroidered cloth, which formed the centerpiece of the ceremonial. Yes, and th that, con that actually carried the kiss for the embroidered cloth that covered the entrance to the Kaaba, representing the patronage of the ruler. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I'd like to comment on. Any one of them which you think needs comment, please. Yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry, but Salim does not go to Mecca and Medina. Um, he, he goes to Cairo um, and sails back uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, Constantinople from, from Egypt. You might be thinking of Jem Sultan. Um, Jem. Mm. Sorry, my apologies. Yavuz Sultan Salim, is that somebody else? Is, I the mean, Jem Sultan and, and Yavuz are two different per people, yes. Okay, I just mentioned him. He happened to have the same name. Okay, um, so Jem, Jem goes, but Jem goes as a prince. He's not, um, he, he never becomes a uh, Sultan. And you're right about the Mahmal and the, and the, and the Qiswa. That, that, that's true. Um, um, and the, the Ottomans patronize the, the Hajj in all kinds of ways, of course, sponsoring the caravans. They undertake um, 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 reconstruction projects in the holy sites. Um, they support them financially, of course. Of course, they support them in all kinds of ways. Um, and, and look, I think the question of going on Hajj or not, while obviously you know, hugely important within, um, within Islam, I don't know how much we should dwell on that to, to understand the religiosity of, of the Sultan. It's only one one factor. Yeah. Sure. Yes. And besides, uh, I, I saw. Um, you go on I, I saw the, uh, yeah, I think I saw uh, Anis's hand raised up. Is there Anis who wanted to ask a question? Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Can you uh, no, um, I think my, my question was covered by the previous brother who asked about why the Ottoman, none of the Ottoman Empire, you know, rulers, they performed Hajj. So I'll be really interested to know what is the main reason for them not performing the Hajj. One is, of course, the security, but, you know, the security yeah. uh, question, uh, I don't understand, you know, what was that? Uh, you know, uh, security that they couldn't perform hard. So if you can, you know, elaborate on that, please, if possible. Thank you. Sure, thanks for that question. Um, so it, it is it is a major security uh, um, operation for the Sultan to go on Hajj for a couple of reasons. One is this sheer distance. Um, so uh, Salim, another reason that he's, um, um, uh, exceptional in the in the history of the Ottoman Empire is he he travels further than any other sultan uh, to Cairo um, himself. Uh, Suleiman will go to to Baghdad, um, but after that the sultans tend to uh, remain pretty close to Istanbul. So anytime that the sultan um, leaves the capital and goes on the road 
the road is a dangerous place. You have bandits, you have um, other armies. Um, it's rough where you get your food provisions. Weather becomes an issue. It, it's, a major, it's a major undertaking. It's also security threat because you're leaving the capital exposed. Um, who is in charge uh, while one is gone? Um, um, might a rival you know, try to seek uh, uh, the throne and exploit the um, absence of the Sultan from, uh, from Constantinople? There was a, there's a notion in the Ottoman world that um, the Sultan is the state. And so if the state is, is moving, where is the state, uh, if you like? Um, so those, those, are, those are the main, the main reasons for the security worries of going on Hajj. There are various points in Ottoman history where sultans threaten to go on Hajj. Um, um, but, and and uh, one particular case in the early 17th century where one pretends to begin going down the road to go on Hajj, but actually never, never goes. Um, when Jem Sultan, who I mentioned before, um, does travel uh, to Mecca and Medina, he's going to try to drum up support uh, for his bid to take over the throne, which is ultimately unsuccessful. Thank you. Uh, Afreli, sir, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mikhail, for your very, uh, for wonderful uh, uh, presentation, or at least opening and, and the discussion, you know, a very enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, you know, my question is, uh, you know, uh, Salim, uh, how much did he, uh, I know, I, he, my view of him is more of a warrior, you know, a soldier who expanded the uh, Muslim empire. Intellectual side, is there anything, any legacy that he left behind uh, mm -hmm. that could say that, yes, he was a patron of uh, learning, knowledge? Because uh, during this time, I don't know how much was he influenced or bothered by the Renaissance that was happening elsewhere, and what uh, was he at all involved in? Uh, you know, banning the use of uh, uh, the printing press, uh, the Gutenberg uh, press. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in his uh, intellectual legacy, if if any. Yeah, thank Thanks. you for that for that question. Um, so, you know, I, I, I will disappoint you in that his intellectual legacy is not vast um, for all the, all, the, all the kind of reasons that you state. He, he does spend most of his, certainly most of his sultanate outside of Istanbul uh, in war. So against the Safavids, you know, when he first takes over the throne in 1512, um, he spends the first nine months of his, uh, of his reign going after his half brothers and killing them. Then he goes after the Safavids, and that's a huge campaign. So if you like, sort of 1512 to early 1513 is spent going after his brothers, 1513 to 1514, and into early 1515 is the Safavid campaign, 1516, 1517 against the Mamluks. Um, um, he comes back uh, to Istanbul, and he dies in 1520. So for most of that period of his sultanate, he's in battle, uh, waging war. Uh, when he's governor of Trabzon, he spends a lot of that period also um, in battle, um, 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 fending off rivals to the east. So, but in terms of his his contribution to letters and the arts and things, there are a couple we can we can think of. Um, he wasn't a major patron of the arts. He didn't undertake any large architectural projects during his reign. Um, he wrote some poetry, which is not great, um, and is is a lot of it is about his conquests about how wonderful his conquests were, the cities he conquered, the riches he won, those kinds of things. Um, um, in terms of his writings, that's the major sort of artistic output. You know, if we were to think about his artistic legacies beyond that though, um, very important to that is what I mentioned before of the bringing of artisans, thinkers, writers, painters, architects, et cetera, to Istanbul after the conquest of the Mamluk empire a process that will continue after his reign. Um, many of those artisans come to Constantinople and will be part of the flowering of the arts and architecture and literature um, that occurs during the reign of his son, Suleiman the Magnificent. One of the reasons that we um, term uh, um, Suleiman the Magnificent is because of all of the artistic output that happens during his reign. Um, um, Sinan the architect, all of the poets, etc. 
Um, uh, uh, Salim, you know, lays the groundwork for some of that happening through the expansion of the empire and the riches that come with that. And then also bringing these people um, to Istanbul. But directly, Salim is not involved in any major artistic um, undertakings. Again, part of the reason that you're right, that he's usually thought of as more of a brute, right? As a warrior, um, um, as, as a violent sultan, rather than one interested in the, in, in the kind of the, the arts. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't see any other hands raised here. Uh, or maybe somebody who wants to ask a question can simply add Newton ask. Hi. Uh, hello. Yes, Hi. go ahead. Yes, I am Mubashir from India. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, my question is uh, you have uh, said that Columbus has a kind of was a kind of Islamophobe, Islamophobe. Uh, I have heard that Vasco da, Vasco da Gama, why, when he, he, Vasco da Gama, when he came to the Malabar coast in India, he, uh, he did a, he used to uh, intercept the Hajj pilgrimage and they, they and they sometimes used to disguise themselves as a M Muslim so that they can, uh, uh, and their voyage knowledge, they can steal their topographies like that. Uh, is it true? Um, I, I don't know directly about, about that story of, of Vasco da Gama and the, um, you know, the disguising as pilgrims um, to steal information. I mean, it, it, it is, there are numerous examples of, of people posing as Muslims to go on Hajj for all kinds of different different reasons but that specific story i don't i don't know about yeah i can see najid's hands raised najid please go ahead najid can you hear me you can you have to unmute yourself i think najid can you hear me yep thank you uh, yeah i need to unmute can you yourself. hear me now yeah okay, i can hear you right. now please go ahead yeah all right Excellent talk, my, uh, Mikhail. Um, the question I have is, uh, we know that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the guy from, uh, oh, I forget his name, who started to come to America, Columbus. Yeah. He started from Spain. <laughs> yeah, I know, age. He started from Spain uh, sometimes in the 15th century, and he started to go to India but the sphericity of the earth was only established in the 16th century. How was he sure that going west, he could arrive in India? Any idea? Yeah, I mean, there, he had various theories as to why a Western route um, was, uh, was not only possible, but better. Um, so one is, um, when he's in um, Portugal, before he goes to Spain, he goes to England. And um, he hears from sailors there that often um, um, wood will wash up on shore that seems to have been worked by human hands. Um, and so he surmises that uh, the, the coast of, 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 of Asia, the Eastern coast of Asia, um, is where this, this stuff is coming from. And it's probably not that far away. Um, because if, if wood is washing up on shore, then the continent land can't be that far away. He also thinks um, when he's in West Africa, uh, Columbus sails with the group around Henry the Navigator and ends up in West Africa on the Gold Coast. Um, he thinks that according to contemporary understandings of topography and geography, that um, areas at the same latitude um, have similar features. And so he thinks that if he sails directly west from West Africa, that he'll, he'll land upon a place with a lot of gold, which will be very important for him to raise an army to retake Jerusalem, et cetera. Um, and so he, he in fact does head a little south um, before he heads west so that he can kind of follow um, um, the dominant currents of of the ocean that push west from uh, West Africa. So, um, you know, he believes that 
um, uh, he will be able to find this Western, this Western route for, for all of these reasons. He also, you know, he's been studying cartography for a little while, which tells him that Asia is just on the other side of, of the ocean. So that's where, um, you know, he gets the idea. No wonder he lands up in America. <laughs> America right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other question? Of course, Afsar, Afsar Adibhai, I can see your hands raised, but can you just give me a minute if, if there's anybody? Yeah, yeah. Else that's is, why I'm, I'm not is, asking a question. Yeah. <laughs> just in case there are no other questions. In case, yeah, in case there are no other questions, perhaps then you can come back to Same you. with me. If there's no other question, I've got one more also, a comment. Yeah, sure. So anyone else? Uh, maybe they can raise their hands or maybe just unmute and ask. Today, Habib hasn't asked a question. He normally asks, always. OK. OK, since uh, uh, maybe we'll give some more time. In the meantime, we'll come, we'll come to Afsar Bhai. Afsar Ali Bhai, please, you have, with your, yeah. uh, you can ask yes. a question. Uh, uh, Professor Mikhail, uh, you did mention uh, uh, Sultan Salim's influence towards uh, on the eastern uh, side of the Ottoman Empire initially, even before he became the Sultan. Did he have any, uh, considering how long his father ruled, uh, did he have any influence on the what was going on uh, in the on the western side? Uh, like, for example, did he play uh, any role uh, in, say, the uh, uh, evacuation of the, uh, the the Jews around the time of uh, the Spanish uh, Inquisition when uh, his father was supposedly sending his, the Ottoman fleet? Uh, uh, did he have any other uh, any influence uh, on the western side of the? Uh, of the Ottoman Empire, and the second part, if at all uh, you, uh, if you can address, if you would please address it, it would be great. I was trying to figure out when was the ban on the printing press uh, uh, put out, because that, uh, to me, contributed quite a lot to the decay mm -hmm. of the uh, Ottoman Empire, the long-term effects of the intellectual decadence. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so um, all the things that you um, mentioned about uh, the Western part of the empire are true. Um, Salim doesn't have any direct hand in them. Um, so one of the also distinguishing features of, of Salim's life and reign is that most of the expansion that he undertakes, all the expansion he undertakes, um, in all the fighting that he does is in the East um, against the Safavids, uh, against his own subjects in Eastern Anatolia, against the Mamluks. Um, most of Ottoman expansion at that point, and then later as well, will push West in places like Hungary, um, in the Mediterranean. I mean, he does push West in North Africa, um, but that's, you know, that's a different kind of West than, than, than Europe, obviously. Um, um, so during his father's reign, you're right that um, many Jews that are expelled in 1492 eventually make their way to the Ottoman Empire. Some immediately, some it takes, you know, quite a few decades. Um, the other major aspect of his father's expansion is that he pushes west in, um, you know, what is today Greece and Albania, um, and also captures for a year the only territory the Ottomans will ever have on the Italian peninsula. Sicily. The city of Otranto, yeah, in 1480. This is Bayezid, uh, Salim's father. Um, oh, the, oh, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm mistaken. That's his grandfather, Mehmet II, uh, conquers uh, that. And you're referring that. to Sicily, right? No, Otranto is the city that is on the very tip of the, the heel. East. Mm. Oh, I see. Okay. If you think of the boots and the the the, oh, the okay. heel, oh, oh yeah, okay. out, the very tip. So it, I, I misspoke. It was Mehmed II, the conqueror of Constantinople, captures it in 1480, and it's because of the succession crisis after his death in 1481 that brings Bayezid um, to the throne that the Ottomans have to pull out of of that territory. Um, Sicily is important though to the story because 
um, the Spanish sovereigns who ostensibly have some claim over Sicily because of the dynastic politics of Europe, um, hear that the Ottomans are contemplating sending a fleet from Otranto to Sicily, um, which is, you know, Sicily is obviously very strategic in the Mediterranean as the largest island, the kind of gateway between East and West. And so that, that um, causes them to, uh, to send a force um, to try to protect um, Sicily. But again, all this be, be, becomes a, a moot point because uh, Mehmed dies. Uh, the printing press. So um, yeah, there's a lot written about, um, you know, should the Ottomans have adopted the printing press? Why didn't they adopt the printing press? Is it because there's some, you know, uh, a precept in Islam that's against printing or something like that? Um, my answer to that is that um, manuscript culture was alive and well and worked very well. Um, manuscript culture remained in the Ottoman Empire after the printing press. The printing press comes in um, um, in the 18th century in a very real way in the Ottoman Empire. But even then, manuscript culture um, remains. So there is some printing that happens in the, in the Ottoman world in Salonika, not unrelated to what we were just discussing. Um, um, Jewish communities there do set up a printing press, um, um, but uh, it, the, the printing press is not taken up in any widespread way in, in the Ottoman world. Again, I think about, uh, you know, when, when, when historians generally don't like questions about, not that your question, there's any problem with your question, but uh, what would have happened or counterfactuals, why didn't something happen? You know, why didn't the Ottomans cross the Atlantic? Um, why didn't they take up the printing press? I think the answers to that are they didn't need to. The Ottomans didn't need to cross the Atlantic because they were such a powerful force in the old world. Um, and crossing the Atlantic was risky business. You know, let the Europeans do it who, you know, are desperate and, and are looking for some other means of power. Uh, printing press uh, doesn't seem to solve a, a problem that exists. Again, print culture is very able to, uh, to, uh, um, to, um, um, to meet the needs of Ottoman society. The printing press is very useful in Europe because um, uh, uh, for political reasons, it allows propagandists, if you like, to spread their message uh, wide and far very quickly. So for Martin Luther and the Reformation, you know, that rebellious act, um, he's able to print uh, his letters and writings very quickly and spread them around. The same thing in, in the Dutch world, right? Um, William of Orange, when he writes his propagandistic texts, is able to print them very quickly and spread them around against the Spanish. Um, so in the Ottoman world, you might say that we don't have that kind of politics. And so maybe that's not, um, there, there's no spur to that kind of use of spreading around propaganda that you have in Europe. Um, but in any case, the, the, the printing press, I think, doesn't take hold because um, it, it doesn't solve a problem that exists. You know, the cost of um, spreading knowledge, books, reproducing books, affordability to the, for the common man, that makes well, a right. big difference. Yeah, it, no, you're absolutely right. But those concepts are, are very modern concepts, right, of spreading around knowledge, of kind of general, general um, um, edification of society. The Ottomans weren't, knowledge was elite, right? Books were um, a luxury commodity, right? Um, books are uh, things that people put a lot of time and effort and money into. Having a book is a sign of privilege. You don't want to spread that, that out. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I think uh, Rashid can go ahead with this question now. Yes, uh, just two things. Number one, uh, you said about the local uh, printing press not being liked by Islam. I think again, like I said in my previous one, we must not get confused between Islam and Muslims. It probably was a Muslim uh, scholar or ruler who maybe was against the Gutenberg printing press. Not Islamically, to my knowledge, anything in Islam stops you from using the printing press. Secondly, regarding the comment on the previous questioner's Vasco da Gama episode, uh, I'd like to say that after the Vasco da Gama raided several Muslim ports along the East African coast, he then began a campaign of terror against Muslim shipping off the Malabar coast, and he captured a ship called the Mary, M-E-R-I, probably meaning mine, and not M-A-R-Y, a ship with 200 Muslim pilgrims 
who are returning from Hajj, from Makkah, and he sets a light. I don't know whether anybody died, but I would suggest that they may have. Thank you very much. So that was a comment then, basically. Well, more a comment, I suppose, okay. rather than, yeah, two comments on your statement about Islam and Muslim. Because, you know, the biggest, a man who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, George Bernard Shaw, he said that Islam is the greatest religion, but the Muslim, the worst example of it. And I think sometimes we make a mistake between Islam and Muslims. Would you like to comment on that, maybe? No, I, I appreciate the comment. I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Anyone else would like to go now for the question? Please feel free to unmute and ask. Well, um, I don't think there are any more questions, or are they? Otherwise, we can close the discussion. Because that will save half an hour. Uh, sorry, yeah, well, I just want to, I'm curious to know more about why the printing press uh, was considered, like, was it, because to my understanding, they were quite, you know, well off, uh, you know, people during that time. And, you know, what is the reason for considering book as a luxury or item or, for example, closing the, this is somewhat, you know, I don't have much knowledge about the history of Ottoman Empire, but just as a layman, I'm curious to know if you can expand on the reasons for not having the printing press. Thank you, Jazakallah. So just to add to what I said before, you know, Paper is expensive, ink is expensive. The expertise of, of copying, of calligraphy, of um, uh, painting, if it's an illuminated manuscript, all of these are, are, are expert tasks that require a great deal of expertise um, that not many people possess, um, and they charge a great deal to undertake them. So. Um, for example, if any of you read, it's a novel, but it's good on this point, is um, My Name is Red by Orhan Pamuk, um, revolves around the creation of a single manuscript. Um, and it shows that, you know, every manuscript is um, worked on by multiple hands, um, that um, it's very expensive, um, the place of it in, um, in elite culture, et cetera. So um, very few people possessed books um, in, in the early modern world. That's true, not just in the Ottoman world, of course. Um, and so the, the printing press does represent a sort of democratization of knowledge, um, but um, it's, not, it's not something, again, that you see um, in, in the Ottoman world until the 18th century. And even then, books um, are in some ways a, a kind of luxury, uh, luxury item. There's also a story about literacy rates that one could talk about here. Um, of course, in the Ottoman world, literacy rates are probably higher than elsewhere just because of uh, Quranic schools and, and memorization and these kinds of things, um, um, but uh, is, is nowhere near the kind of widespread uh, nature that we might think of today. Um, and again, the kind of writing and reading people would be doing would be in a kind of business context in purchasing and contracts and things like that. Um, you know, very few people read for pleasure or anything like that in the early modern world. In fact, we have a, a, a question from Shazia Samreen on the chat box. She wants to know whether the current Shia Sunni rivalry is legacy of Salim. <laughs> so that's a large question. Um, I, I would say Salim contributes to it. He's not the originator of it, obviously. Um, um, you know, he's not, uh, he's, a, he's a piece of it, right? So, um, and he's a piece of it in the following way. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning, this notion of confessionalization. So the idea that uh, political states will attach their fortunes, um, will um, um, pin their legitimacy on um, uh, being adherents, defenders, 
monopolizers of a single religion. So Salim after 1516, 1517, clearly makes the Ottomans the foremost Sunni power of the world uh, with the conquest of Mecca and Medina. A few years before that in 1501, the Safavids um, in Iran um, tie their state's fortunes to Shiism. So they meld Shiism and Persian notions of kingship uh, for the first time to create um, you know, a Shiite empire uh, with territorial ambitions in the Middle East. Um, and so that clash between a Sunni empire with territorial ambitions, a Shiite empire with territorial ambitions um, is part of, of, of contributing to the kind of Sunni Shia rivalry that we see today um, in the Middle East. Again, there were Sunni states before, there were Shiite states before, but to the extent of, of of kind of dominate, attempting to dominate the Middle East. Um, this is something that happens during, uh, begins in Salim's uh, time, and then will um, accelerate over the next century and a half. Iraq goes back and forth. As I said before, Suleiman um, goes to Baghdad, that's on campaign against the Shiites. Um, so the, so the, the Shiites and the Ottomans are each other's primary rivals um, for uh, around 200, uh, 200 years. And for Salim and the Ottomans in this period, um, you know, when they, they think of their civilizational rivals, um, they think of the Shiites. As I said before, for Spanish Catholics, um, their civilizational rivals are Muslims, um, sometimes Jews, but non-Christians, right? Um, and for the Ottomans, their, their major um, um, millennial um, enemies are, are other Muslims. Interesting. In fact, uh, the... There's another participant uh, who wants to ask you, Sajid Inamda. Uh, he wants you to expand a bit on uh, the printing press and he wants to know if uh, Ottoman sultans really banned the presses, the printing presses. Was it really banned? He's not no. sure about it. No, no, no. There was no, there was no sort of official ban on the printing press. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Even I was not aware of that because that's what is um, quite well known, you know, from the mm -hmm. time... I think, um, if I'm not wrong, Bernard Lewis kind of popularized the concept, right? Yeah. In, in his book, What Went Wrong. Right. They said that, uh, I mean, the ulama kind of issued a fatwa against it. Perhaps yeah. uh, that's what most people think of. So there was no ban as such, Alan, right? Or right. was there a fatwa? No fatwa uh -huh. either, right? What, what about a fatwa against it? Well, the, there might have been fatwas against the printing press, but, okay. you know, a fatwa is not, I mean, anyone... Not anyone, but yes, it's official ban. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's true. And we have um, uh, the person called Mubarak Khalil. He wants to know. Uh, thank you for this interesting discussion, but I think that using the term Ottoman Empire is inappropriate because it is either a caliphate or a sul sultanate. <laughs> it, it, um, it, yeah, I mean, you know, one, that, that is the conventional use that scholars undertake of calling it an, an empire. I mean, I would defend the use of the term empire in that, um, what do we mean by empire? A, a, a state that um, undertakes territorial expansion, um, that um, has a relationship between um, subjects and sovereigns characterized by the extraction of taxation, military service, et cetera, um, but that nevertheless allows some autonomy for communities within the, the empire. Um, it, is a, it is a political uh, designation. Um, okay. and, and so I think using the term empire to talk about the Ottomans both makes sense and it also allows us to think about the Ottomans in comparative terms that we can talk about their politics and their society and their culture in the ways that we can talk about um, you know, Spanish or Russian or Qing politics, culture, etc. Okay. I don't see any more questions here. Or I, anyone who wants to ask the question directly by unmuting, or if not, maybe we can close the discussion. Well, I don't think uh, there are any more questions, Alan. Uh, I think. You, you almost covered it. <laughs> it, it. It was as good as reading the book. In fact, I have it here with me. And for those who, who, who haven't yet, uh, purchased it, I would recommend this book to be purchased. It's an excellent read. 
and uh, you know fascinating in fact you know you, you, you get transported into the ottoman past it was it's wonderful uh, thank you so much for writing the book alan <laughs> Thank you very much, Faiz. I, I appreciated all the questions and the comments. Yeah, I'm glad. And we're also very happy that you could share this time with us. And uh, I think this this is the, just the beginning of a, uh, what do you call, excellent relationship. And uh, inshallah, I hope that uh, we will be able to invite you to India very soon after the COVID. In fact, I am thinking of a kind of a conference of some different scholars uh, and I'm sure I think uh, that would be a great thing if you could also join us at that time, so probably after a year, inshallah. So, I'd love to be there. Great. So th once again, I thanks a lot. For, I thank you a lot for your for the time. And that was an absolutely wonderful presentation. And we delved into almost all aspects, including Columbus to um, Salib Kosve, and even the even the concubine. Uh, you know, uh, I forgot her name. You just, uh, uh, Gulbahar, right? Mm -hmm. That was Gulbahar. I mean, the one one person we didn't discuss perhaps was Martin Luther. You wanted to, you mentioned him, but perhaps we didn't have uh, time. And, the, and I thought somebody would ask him the, uh, in the Q&A session, but they skipped it. But nevertheless, uh, we have almost come to the end of our um, time. And I must thank you for being here. And being a Sunday, I don't think we should hold you back further. I <laughs> should have let you go now. <laughs> Thank you so, very much, guys. Look forward to having you once again on this program, uh, uh, Alan.